Hi everyone and welcome back to the class on the practice and pitfalls of studying organic reaction mechanisms. We've made it through the introductory lecture, I hope you enjoyed it. And now we're on to the formal lecture one on the fundamentals of studying mechanisms. This is another brief introductory video from me to you from my office at Strathclyde. This time you can see me and my favourite canvas from the movie Pulp Fiction. I think it's really cool, I hope you like it too. But anyway, back to business. In lecture one and fundamentals, we're looking at things like order of reaction, molecularity, elementary steps, steady state, pre-equilibrium. Some of the real bread and butter terms that someone studying kinetics will use. For those of you who are in groups who do at least some kinetics, these terms might seem even simple or a waste of time to go over, but I really hope that's not the case. I've tried to simulate a lot of data and show you different variations on the graphs that emerge from the equations that we see when we're studying mechanisms for the first time. In fact, I'm sure many of you will agree that when you study mechanisms at undergraduate level, the equations are the first and sometimes the only thing you see. I'm hoping to lift those equations off the page and show more graphical data that I hope will help some of these simple but really important concepts sink in. If you do see anything that's new to you or something that you're seeing in a slightly different way through this class, please do reach out to me. You can do this through the Moodle platform or you can do this direct to me by email. In any case, I look forward to hearing from you and I hope you enjoy this first lecture, lecture one, on the fundamentals of studying reaction mechanisms. Thank you. Hi everyone and welcome to lecture one on fundamentals. When we're talking about reaction mechanisms, that's intimately linked with talking about rate and, of course, kinetics. So we begin this lecture with a very simple question. What is rate? Rate, in terms of chemistry, we can derive by looking at a simple chemical equation like this one, with A plus B going to product P, with some rate constant lowercase k1. If we look, for example, at the emergence of product P with time, as we can see in this graph below, and we plot concentration of P versus time, the reaction profile is shown by the blue curve. The rate of reaction is simply the tangent to that curve at some point in time. Now, I've shown this graph for product P. We could show similar graphs for the decay of reactants A and B and get the rates of reaction for those species decaying. So in this case, the rate of reaction is the tangent to the curve, the concentration of P versus time. To put that more formally, it's the rate of change of concentration with respect to time. And it's measured most normally in moles per decimeter cubed per second, or moles per liter per second, or most simply, and in shorthand, molar per second. Going forward, let's have a bit of a warm-up. Let's think about a question to do with kinetics and reaction order. In that same simple reaction that we saw in the previous slide, A plus B goes to P, think about this question. What is the overall order of the reaction below? If you want to think about this more before going on, please pause the video now. But in the interest of time, we'll move on. And the answer is simply this. We don't know. We don't know because only experiment can tell us the order of reaction. Look at these three cases in the graphs below where we're looking at the decay of reactant A versus time. So we're plotting the concentration of A versus time. In case 1, we have a linear decay of A. In cases 2 and 3, we have a more curved, what looks like an exponential decay of reactant A. What you'll notice in case 1 is that the curvature is less pronounced, but we get to zero concentration of A much more quickly than in the final case where there's a longer tail. And there's a longer tail even though 
there's a steeper descent. So there's three different modes of reactivity going on here, and it's experiment that tells us that. We can't think about order of reaction without doing some experiments. Before any experiment, remember, everything is simply a guess or a hypothesis. To put that another way, the simple reaction that we drew down on paper before could be this in reality. A and B could come together directly to form P. But by the same chord, we may have A first decaying to some intermediate I, which then interacts with B to go to the product P. Let's now move on and look at the kinetic analysis of simple systems. And we start with zero order reactions. If we look to the top left, we can see the differential rate equation, the rate of reaction with respect to A is the rate of change of A with respect to time, and that can be expressed as some rate constant lowercase k times the concentration of A to the power zero, hence zero order. So the rate is simply equal to the rate constant. And when we integrate this equation to have a linear form, we can see that A at time t is equal to A at time zero minus the rate constant times time. And when we graph this relationship, we see that the concentration of A decays linearly with time. So the slope is simply the negative rate constant. So the slope times minus one is equal to k. Another way to think about zero order reactions is if we graph the rate versus the concentration of A as we increase the concentration of A, the rate of reaction is completely unaffected. In other words, the rate of reaction is independent of A. The reaction is zero order in A. We'll come back to zero order reactions in our lecture on catalytic systems. For now, we move on to first order reactions where we have a process where A transforms or decays to product P with a rate constant K1. The differential rate equation in this case is shown here, where the rate of change of A with respect to time is equal to rate constant K1 times the concentration of A to the power one, hence first order. We simply don't show the one here, of course. If we look to first order relationships graphically, Let's look first of all at a graph of concentration of A as it decays with time. Now you can see several lines here, and I've shown a first order decay for a rate constant of 0 0.01 per second, per second being the units, and I've shown that for different initial concentrations of A. So what to notice here are two things. One is that as we increase the initial concentration of A, I hope that you can see that the descent, the steepness of the slope increases. It's steeper here than it is here. And secondly, notice that all of these curves eventually get down towards a zero concentration in a relatively short time. That will become important when we look at a second order reaction. Let's look at this alternative plot relating to a first order relationship. Here we plot the rate of formation of the product P versus the concentration of A. So as we increase the concentration of A, notice if we follow the blue line that we have a linear increase in the rate of formation of product P. Now you will have surely noticed that there's more than one line on this second plot. And that's because I wanted to show you that as we change the rate constant, K1, the steepness of this line increases. So the blue line is for a rate constant of 0 0.01, and that comes out in the slope. And then we increase that to 0 0.02 and to 0 0.04. And every time that linear relationship between rate and concentration is maintained, but the linear relationship is becoming steeper. We're 
increasing the gradient, increasing the rate constant. As a final thought on first order processes, let's now look at how we form a linear version of a rate expression. If we integrate the rate expression for a first order reaction, we get this relationship where the natural log of a at time t is equal to the natural log of a at time zero minus kt. So when we plot the log of concentration at time t versus time, we get this linear plot showing on the right hand side. So we've got the log of a versus time up here. And we can see a linear relationship in which the gradient, the slope, is the negative rate constant. So this number times negative 1 is a rate constant 0 0.01 as shown here. Moving on to second order reactions, you've noticed right away that we call this second order class 1. And it's class 1 because we're talking about two chemical entities of the same identity coming together, A plus A, to form our product P. That's of course the same as writing 2A going to product P, again with a rate constant K1. Our rate expression this time is slightly different and now we have the rate is equal to the rate constant times A squared, so no longer A to the power 1 but a to the power 2, hence second order. Looking to our graphical data again, if we simulate a second order process and show concentration versus time, we can see the following relationship. Now, the thing to notice here is that, as with first order reactions, if we have a, a higher starting concentration of A, we have a steeper initial descent, the slope here, for a starting concentration of one molar is significantly steeper than a starting concentration here of 0 0.2 molar. The more subtle difference between first and second order processes is shown in the tail of this curve where instead of decreasing to zero in short time, a second order process has a much longer tail. It takes much longer to get down to zero concentration of A. If we now look to the right and this alternative plot now showing the rate of formation of product P versus the concentration of A, we see now that as we increase the concentration of A, the trend is no longer a linear. First order reactions show a linear trend as we increase concentration versus the rate of formation of product. But notice now for this second order process, we can see a curved and indeed exponential increase in rate with increasing concentration of A. When we integrate a rate expression to get a linear form of the second order class 1 process, we see this time that 1 over A at time t is equal to 1 over A times 0 plus kt. So this time, if we plot 1 over A at time t versus time, we have a linear plot as shown here. But this time, the gradient is directly proportional, directly equal to the rate constant k1. Let's move on and think about another question. We've now looked at 0, 1st and one class of second order reaction profiles. The question this time is, can you think of a way to distinguish a first order reaction from any other? And I show the first order equations here again to stimulate, stimulate your thought. Again, if you want to think about this, please pause the video now. If not, then we'll move on and show the answer. And the answer is in the half-life of a first-order reaction. If we take the linear form, the integrated rate equation for a first-order reaction, and rearrange in the form shown here, we have a form now where we have a ratio 
of concentrations of A at time zero and A at some other time T. At 50% of conversion of A, i.e. the half-life of the reaction, then we can substitute into that equation with the concentration of A0. And instead of A at time T, we can call that a half of the concentration A0. That collapses to the natural log of 2, and that is what is equal to K times T. So in other words, the half-life K times T to the half here is equal to a constant in the natural log of 2. If we look at a plot of concentration versus time for a first order process, we can make that clearer to see. Let's follow the decay of the starting material A. We can see 50% conversion here, then the next 50% down to 25% of the initial concentration here, and so on through 12.5%, 6.3%, and 3.1%. And we can look at a similar trend in the opposite direction for the formation of product P. Again, we go through the crossover point at 50%, and then we see 50% increase again to 75, then 87.5, 93.7, and 96.9. We look at that another way, and look at the point at which we have each of these successive half-lifes. Hopefully you can begin to see that the time between these points is exactly the same. The half-life is constant for a first order reaction. Indeed, in this particular simulated case, the half-life is about 70 seconds, and the next half-life is 70 seconds, and the one after that, and so on and so forth until the reaction is complete. A first order reaction is the only reaction class which has this behavior, and that's how you can separate it from other classes of reaction. Let's move on to another question now and think of a specific example where this would come in handy, where it would be useful to know the difference between first and second order reactions. So let's say we want to follow this substitution reaction where we have sodium cyanide reacting with an alkyl bromide and THF at reflux to form the nitrile compound and sodium bromide as a byproduct. We're following that reaction by infrared, so we can imagine something like a React IR probe to generate data in real time like this shown here. So the question is this. The substitution reaction of sodium cyanide, 0.1 molar, and alkyl bromide, 0.1 molar also, was followed by IR tracking the nitrile stretch of the sodium cyanide. Plotting the data below, what can you conclude about the order of reaction and the rate law? So you can see some data below. If you want to pause the video, you can take this data and try to plot it. To be clear, we have the time here shown in hours, and this I% percent here, think about this as a proxy term for concentration of sodium cyanide, and that's what's shown in the bottom row. So if you want to give this question a go, pause now. If not, we're going to move on. So in looking at the answer to question three, we see that when we plot the data given, there is an apparent first order decay of sodium cyanide with respect to time. So we can see this curved decay and we can see that at the tail, it gets down towards zero pretty quickly. There is no very long elongated tail, tail, as would be the case in a second order plot. But the trick here is to note this. The concentration of sodium cyanide is the same as the alkyl bromide, which are both 0.1 molar to begin with. In other words, the sodium cyanide acts as a sort of proxy for the alkyl bromide. Remember, if we look at first and second order processes, 
we can see these differences in the tails here and how they respond versus time. Really what's going on here in this question is that we have a plot something like this. The decay of sodium cyanide is following an apparent first order decay with a constant half-life and that leads us to think the reaction is first order in sodium cyanide. But in fact what we have here is a rate loss something more like this where we might be tempted to think that the observed rate constant is as a result of an overall second order process, first order in alkyl bromide and first order in sodium cyanide. But in fact what's going on is this in the second equation where we have a rate approximately equal to a rate constant times the concentration of alkyl bromide only. And we can rationalise that by looking at a, a reaction that would have this sort of profile. And we can think about an SN1 process where we have a tertiary alkyl bromide, terbutyl bromide, and that decays to form a tertiary carbocation, and that's the slow step of this reaction. There's then a very fast second step to quench that carbocation, in which we get a nucleophilic attack of the cyanide onto the carbocation to form our nitrile product. To put this yet another way, we see that the sodium cyanide only decays as fast as the carbocation is generated. And so when we follow the loss of sodium cyanide, what we're really following is the rate at which this is formed and immediately quenched. If the reaction was truly second order, such that the alkyl bromide and cyanide came together in the rate limiting step, then we wouldn't see this first order decay, this apparent first order decay of sodium cyanide we would have a plot which shows more of an elongated tail and a more abrupt curvature like a second order reaction should show. If you have any trouble rationalising this question, please feel free to reach out to me online or by email. We're now going to talk about these two very important terms in studying the rates of chemical reactions, steady state and pre-equilibrium. If you remember your kinetic studies from undergraduate classes, you may well have heard of the steady state approximation, and we will go over that in the next few slides. You may not have heard of pre-equilibrium, however, and what I want to show you in this part of the lecture is that these are very much opposite ends of the same spectrum. They are related, but they are extremes at different ends of a scale. And you can see that in the plots shown below where we have simulated data for a starting material A, an intermediate I, and a product P. In the first plot we have something that shows the decay of starting material A and almost no build-up of any intermediate. In the second case we have something very different. The starting material A abruptly decreases to near zero almost immediately and what we follow over the course of the reaction is actually the decay of the intermediate. These are two related but extreme cases of a scale of reactivity, steady state versus pre-equilibrium. So let's look at them in more detail. In the steady state approximation, we're looking at a process that can be simplified in this way, where A decays to an intermediate I through a slow equilibration process. The forward reaction K1 has a much lower rate constant than the backward reaction to reform A. That intermediate I then decays in a fast secondary process to form the product P. In pre-equilibrium, however, the first step is a fast and quickly established equilibrium where A 
decaying to I, and the reverse process establish equilibrium very quickly, hence the term pre-equilibrium. It's then the second step, the decay of I towards the product, which is the slow step. Building on this, in the steady state approximation, we say that the rate of change of the intermediate with respect to time is approximately zero, and that's the core of the steady state approximation. In pre-equilibrium, we say that the ratio of the forward rate constant k1 and the reverse rate constant k to the minus 1 is equal to the equilibrium constant k eq. So there's an equilibrium established in this process. If we take one step further in terms of the equations, we can show the full relationship for each as depicted here. So the rate of formation of product for the steady state case is equal to k2 times i. And that's the relationship shown here. This is the only step that directly shows the formation of product. But in using the steady state approximation, we can simplify that equation as shown here on the right hand side so that the rate of formation of product P is shown only in terms of starting chemicals, in this case A, with no intermediates present in the equation. So you can see in this equation what we're dealing with are all the rate constants K1, K2, K-1 and K2 again. In pre-equilibrium, however, the rate of formation of product can be expressed like this, where the rate of formation of product is the rate constant K2 for the second process times the equilibrium constant for the first process, all times by the concentration of A. So in the pre-equilibrium case, we have an established equilibrium constant as part of our expression. At this point, you would be forgiven for thinking this is an incredibly dense slide. It's filled with the sorts of equations that might have put many of us off studying mechanisms at the undergraduate level. I want now to show you these related processes graphically to give you an appreciation of how they're linked. If we look at steady state versus pre-equilibrium graphically, we come back to the plots which I showed at the start of the section where we have in the steady state case, we follow the decay of A directly over time and the amount of intermediate buildup is almost negligible. And in fact, in this green line here, you can see graphically the whole derivation of the steady state approximation. You can see the intermediate doesn't really change much in concentration over time especially when you compare it to the change in concentration of A and indeed the concentration of product. Pre-equilibrium tells a very different story where first and very quickly we establish an equilibrium between A and the intermediate I and it's the decay of the intermediate I which we follow over time. So we see this step here, the equilibrium being established very quickly and then we see the slow decay of the intermediate towards the product. Here's a bonus question. If we look back at the SN1 process, which made up question 3, which of the scenarios do you think fits this reaction best? Is this SN1 process more like a steady state? Or is it more like a pre-equilibrium process? Again, if you want to have a go, pause the video now. The answer is that it's more like the steady state case. We don't have an established equilibrium between the alkyl bromide and the carbocation, so to speak. As soon as the slow step, the formation of the carbocation takes place, that either very quickly decays back to the alkyl bromide or, as we see, it goes quickly forward in reaction with sodium cyanide to form the nitrile product. So what we see is that 
we follow the loss of the alkyl bromide in this case over time and we see the intermediate, the carbocation, not building up to a significant concentration. Let's tie this all together with a hypothetical example of a reaction we will know. From organic chemistry, this is an example of the Arbuzov reaction. And in this reaction, we see a phosphate reacting with an alpha bromo ester. We form a salt like intermediate, and then this decays by attack of the bromide into the ethyl group and formation of a PO double bond as shown in the second step here to form a phosphonate ester and ethyl bromide. If we start to add some labels to this, we can see how we can tie it into the lecture as we've learned about in previous slides. If we put labels on each of the components, I've called these A, B, intermediate I, main product P and secondary product C. And you can already see that we have two different rate constants for process 1, K1 and process 2, K2. If we build on that further, we can look at the overall process of forming product P and we can come up with a macroscopic rate expression as shown here. Well, the macroscopic rate is equal to the rate constant that we observe times the concentration of A to the power A, the concentration of B to the power B, and the concentration of intermediate I to the power I. These things of all potential importance in the formation of P. I've given you a hint with regards to temperature dependence and something we'll talk about in a future lecture. The observed rate constant in this case for the macroscopic overall process, K-OBS, is defined by the Arrhenius rate law. That's the empirically observed rate constant where we're relating the observed rate constant to the activation energy and of course temperature. If we break this down further we can look at the two individual steps in turn. If we look at A plus B goes to intermediate I, this is a bimolecular elementary step. So elementary step is a new term here. Elementary step is simply one part of the overall reaction profile. It's one reaction step in a combination of steps that give us the overall reaction profile. So the rate expression for this step is equal to K1 times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. In the second process, we have a unimolecular elementary step because we have one compound, not two, coming together. Now that remember this is a salt, so it's strictly one intermediate, not two. And the rate expression for this part of the profile is rate equal to K2 times intermediate I. And for either of these microscopic steps, then we would look to relate the temperature dependence through the airing equation, not the Arrhenius rate law. The airing equation is an analytical expression which looks at individual steps only. The Arrhenius rate law is in relation to the overall reaction profile and we'll come back to this in our lecture on temperature dependence. Taking this forward, I now want to graphically show you three scenarios in which we change the rate constants K1 and K2. In the first case, as shown in this graph in the bottom left, we have a change in concentrations versus time. And in this case, the rate constant for K1 is significantly less than the rate constant K2. In this case, we see something that would look more like the steady state. So we watch A decaying directly. And we see a very small build-up, almost negligible build-up, 
of the intermediate eye and its concentration doesn't change much with time. Let's look now at this scenario where K1 and K2 are actually equal to one another. In this case, you'll notice that there's a more significant buildup of the intermediate eye. That's the thing that we're looking at most closely here. And in that process, we can see now that the evolution of product P has a small induction period because we're looking at the buildup of an intermediate before we get significant decay towards product. K1 and K2 are equal. In the final case, we're looking at the case where K2 is larger than K1. And now we see an even more pronounced buildup of intermediate I, which can then be followed over the course of the remaining reaction profile. So in considering these three graphs together, this is what I wanted to show you to tie together steady state versus pre-equilibrium. They are two sides of the same coin. They are two extremes on the same scale. And the equations that we look at for each of those processes are really the ideal scenarios. Many reactions will lie somewhere in between, as shown in the case of the middle graph here. And that's the pitfall that we want to avoid. Many people will think their reaction is one case or another, but it's really likely to be somewhere in between. And that's when we employ things like reaction kinetic software and reaction simulation software to figure out exactly where the reaction lies on this scale. In this last part of lecture one, we're going to talk about the relationship between kinetics and reaction coordinates. In other words, we're talking about the relationship between chemical reaction schemes like these involving rate constants and reaction coordinates like these involving energies and discrete species. These are intimately linked concepts. They are two sides of the same coin. Imagine you're in a collaboration with a computational chemistry colleague. It might be your part of the collaboration to be most concerned with schemes like these, extracting rate constants from your experimental data. Your computational colleague, however, will look at the same problem through a different lens, calculating the theoretical energies of the proposed species in the reaction. A pitfall in studying mechanisms is to forget that these concepts are linked. And in understanding that they are, collaborations such as the example I mentioned, and indeed your holistic understanding of your reaction will be made more productive and far clearer. To take this further, consider one more question in this lecture, question four. For each reaction coordinate diagram, mark a double arrow at the rate determining step, the rate determining transition state energy, delta G double dagger, and you have six examples to try. If you want to do that now before moving on, please pause the video. If not, let's look at the answers. Starting with A, we can see that the transition state barrier related to the rate limiting step is the overall highest energy barrier with respect to the reactant. In a one step reaction, it relates to the only transition state present and that's the case with A. For B and C, the rate determining step is the first of two steps in the reaction coordinate and we can see that we have two distinct transition state barriers, hence two steps. And for B and C, the rate limiting step is the first of those two. In both cases, it also happens to be the largest energy gap between a transition state and the reactant. And there's a subtle point to be made on that based on the other examples. For D and E, the rate determining step is now the second of the two steps in the reaction. And note, in the case of D, you can see that the reactant, the first and lower transition state barrier, and the intermediate will have an equilibrium established 
before the second slower step, that is indeed the rate limiting step. In the case of E, with a higher energy intermediate, there is unlikely to be such an equilibrium established. This would be more in the realms of steady state. The final example, F, is perhaps the one that would trip most people up. The rate determining step is the second step and not the first. Note that the gap between the reactant and the first transition state is larger than from the intermediate to the second transition state. But this does not make it the rate determining step. Remember, the rate determining step is considered relative to the reactant energy. Hence, in case F, the rate limiting step is related to step two. That concludes lecture one, and we have a brief summary of what we've covered Firstly, we looked at the basics and fundamentals of first and second order reactions and we also touched on zero order reactions. To do that, we looked at different graphical ways of representing first and second order processes and how we can tell these apart. We also considered the subtle differences between steady state and pre-equilibrium kinetics and moved to an understanding that these are two ends of a scale, two extreme cases of a related reaction scheme. And finally, we ended on tying in our understanding of rate constants and reaction mechanisms with energy profiles. In all three concepts covered, there are, of course, more detail that we could go into. If you want to know more, please contact me and I'll link you to further information. In the first instance, after all the lectures, I'll add some additional content to help you on your way with understanding. In the meantime, I really hope you've enjoyed lecture one on the fundamentals. As always, contact me on the Moodle page or by email if you have any questions. Thanks for joining me.